There's a kind of problematic appropriation of the Jewish and Christian worlds in the Koran, in the Islamic tradition, that makes a sort of dialogue. You often hear Islam as an Abrahamic religion, only in a very qualified way. I've tried to highlight why um, linking Islam, Christianity, and Judaism as three Abraham relig Abrahamic religions is so problematic. Okay. Uh, whatever their other differences, Guizot, Strauss, and Brog all emphasize the plural and thus the conflictual sources of Western vitality and self-understanding. The West is the West because it resists the temptation to put an end to things, to resolve the human and political problem in a manner that dispenses with the complexity of the human soul. But, I think as we all know, the West is much more the sum of these pre-modern sources and influences that I've just talked about. The contemporary West is defined above all by adherence to democracy and democratic values. For two centuries or more now, the institutions and cultural life of what was once known as Christian civilization have been relentlessly transformed by the doctrine of human rights and by the combined effects of modern science, capitalist economic development, and technological progress. The 19th century French thinker August Comte was not wrong to see in the modern West what he called the avant-garde of humanity, the harbinger of a promised reign of enlightenment and scientific progress that is in principle open to the whole race, the whole human race. Although Comte didn't like the liberty part of the West. He wanted rule by experts, technocratic elite. Uh, in the 19th century, these old and new dispensations, the old West and the new modern West, awkwardly coexisted, And few citizens or statesmen appreciated the full nature of an extent of what Alexis de Tocqueville called the democratic revolution that was transforming the Western world. I think especially in England and the United States, for some reasons that Brad Watson very nicely highlighted, there was a tendency to understate what was new and distinctive in the New West because in the Anglo-American world, moderate versions of the Enlightenment and older moral traditions and affirmations coexisted in relative peace. The Victorian age was all about pretending that somehow the uh, traditions of modern civilization and the older classical and, and Christian traditions perfectly coexisted. Because the British had the good sense, unlike some of their continental brethren, not to throw the baby out with the bath, right? That was the glory of England, you know? That all sort of happily went together. All right. And by the way, the experience of totalitarianism in the 20th century uh, also served, I think, to remind decent Europeans of what the older Christian world and the newer bourgeois or liberal world had in common. Both the old and the new West, the West of, of, uh, of Christianity, of the, of the larger, broader, pre-modern Western tradition, and the New West, the New West of liberalism, bourgeois capitalism, were vulnerable to a virulent revolutionary nihilism that attacked everything that was solid or inherited. Faced with the unprecedented totalitarian negation of constitutionalism, the moral law, the very ideas of unchanging truth and common humanity, liberals and conservatives rallied in support of a West that could draw upon both the modern and pre-modern Western traditions. In the West's death struggle with European totalitarianisms of the left and right, defenders of the Western, uh, of the cause of Western liberty affirmed both the traditional sources of Western freedom and its claim to be the authentic representative of modern liberty. Because the communists famously claim that they were the true representatives, the true embodiment of the cause of progress and liberty and democracy. We forget that the communist regimes called themselves people's democracies, right? 
They claim that they were the truly representative or popular regimes. By the way, if you look at the rhetoric of some of the great conservative-minded statesmen of the 20th century, in the, mid in the midst of this great struggle with totalitarianism, you'll see that people like Winston Churchill and Charles de Gaulle in their World War II speeches spoke about um, the way in which liberal and Christian civilization were threatened by totalitarian nihilism. Uh, I, I, I could cite the uh, peroration to Churchill's marvelous uh, Finest Hour speech of June 18, 1940. It's precisely an appeal to a recognition of the fact that the West is liberal and Christian, that uh, this new totalitarian barbarism threatens everything that is good about the West, right? So I, I mention that I highlight this because it seems to me not too long ago, a half century ago, 60 years ago, there was still a recognition among some European statesmen, people like Churchill, that the West was broader, deeper than our contemporary analysis, our contemporary emphasis on individual rights, on individual autonomy. But this anti-totalitarian con uh, consensus didn't last forever. Um, it, it remained a major presence in European political and intellectual life right up to the revolutionary upheavals of May 1968. That fateful year saw a shattering of the seemingly solid synthesis of the older European moral inheritance and the institutions and principles of modern liberty a synthesis that had survived all the tragic events of the terrible 20th century. And I think, I'm, I'm overstating a bit, May 68 was not some magic turning point, but it was both a symbolic and real turning point. But obviously the seeds for this sort of disillusion of the old synthesis of the new and old West go, go back further. It revealed the fragility and the indispensability of this fruitful coexistence of the new and old dispensations. And we Americans sometimes forget, we, we associate 1968 with unprecedented unrest in the streets and on college campuses, but it was a truly global challenge to liberal civilization in the form of the so-called New West, New Left. I mean, there were uh, student and political rebellions in Italy, in Germany, in Dakar, in Africa, in Tokyo, and most famous of all, in Paris. And in the French case, the May events uh, threaten not only social stability, but the very survival of the political order. For a few days at the end of May 1968, it looked like the, uh, the French ultra-left was in a position to bring down the presidency of Charles de Gaulle and the Fifth French Republic. All right, I have an article in the latest issue of the Intercollegiate Review, 1968 and the Meaning of Democracy, which I encourage you to read, which is a kind of reflection on the meaning and the political and social consequences of May 68. This year was the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the French Fifth Republic. Nobody in France paid any attention. It was the 40th uh, anniversary of the May events and all these old swells, don't we tar, nostalgic for, you know, uh, what they did in May 68. That's all they could talk about. You go into a bookstore, you go to TV, it was a kind of celeb celebratory atmosphere, the glories of May 68. My article is kind of a descent from that uh, consensus. In any case, uh, um, the, May, the, the, May, the, the, the movement of May 68 failed on the political plane, but it succeeded, I think, to a large extent on the social and intellectual planes. And um, um, a whole series of anti-humanist theorists, they're not household names perhaps, but they are in the academy. Louis Althusser, Althusser Michel Foucault. Louis Althusser, by the way, is the man, the French... Uh, uh, Marxist and Freudian who uh, famously murdered his wife, you know, he said he was in bed with her and his hands just inexorably went toward his neck and he strangled her. He got eight months in prison and while he was in prison he wrote his memoir. He's the author of Lear Capital to read Mar uh, Capital of Marx and other gems. He, he's a smart guy by the way. He was a smart guy but uh, he confessed in his memoir that he had never finished an entire book by either Freud, Lenin, or Marx. 
But he was recognized globally as a great interpreter of Marx.